my name is Vitaly Bragilevsky, and in this final talk, the last one before the after party, I'm very sorry that I'm just between you and after party. So I will share my problems with you. So I like dependent types. I like them. I, I will explain why I li li like them. It's it's a beautiful concept. I like theory. They come straight from the theory. So this beautiful thing. But unfortunately, there are a lot of troubles with them. So uh, I will talk about those troubles. Uh, so, but uh, I'll start with some explanation. Who am I? I'm uh, Vitaly Bragilevsky. I work at JetBrains. I also work at Saint Petersburg University. Uh, uh, I also serve as a member of the Glasgow Haskell Compiler Steering Committee, and also there is my book Haskell in Depth. If you are interested, please buy. Uh, it's available in uh, early access, like for ages, early access. Uh, so uh, this talk is about dependent types, and it's about the holy grail of software correctness. So sometimes we want that our software is correct. Sometimes we don't. Now, like some, some people told here, like, well, we don't need tests, we don't need all that stuff, it's okay, it works, and it's fine. But usually we, we want this software correctness stuff. And there is the whole spectrum of methods, how can we achieve software correctness. There are uh, formal methods uh, and there are lightweight sometimes, like for example type systems, if you use types, it's like the lightweight formal method. It is formal because you can prove things about uh, your programs, but it's lightweight because compiler can do almost everything for you when you're using type system. And you can also use formal uh, methods, full-blown formal methods. Like when you have to write specification, algebraic specification, it's a uh, whole language, and you try to explain every detail of your program, and then you can check that. Uh, so if we are talking about dependent types, they are about type system, of course. But in fact, dependent types uh, are actually, they are tools for bringing type system to full-blown formal methods. That means that if you're using dependent types, then uh, you can uh, specify almost everything. Like theoretically, you can specify everything in your program. So the question is, is it a good thing or a bad thing? So is it a good thing to, to be able to specify everything? So, and another question, of course, is what's the price? Are we ready to pay this price to get this uh, uh, thing of software correctness in our programs? Uh, and uh, I should uh, give you a disclaimer. Like, right now in Haskell community and in some other programmers community, communities, uh, there is a debate about simplicity. Some people say, well, we need to write simple programs, we need to use boring Haskell and something like that. And it's not about that. Uh, I know pretty well that if something is not simple today, then it will be simple tomorrow, or maybe in 10 years, but it will be. Like, monads were once a very sophisticated topic. And nowadays, every junior scholar programmer is able to use monads without any problems at all. And they just use them in the ways that I, I'm looking at. I, I don't get that, but well, it's just monads, they tell me. So no problem. So uh, everything which is sophisticated now will be simple tomorrow. So it's not about uh, simplicity, it's just about time. So it's not the problem with dependent types that they are not simple. If they are not, they will be. No problem. All right, so uh, let's, let's talk about what are they. So I will give you two introductions. It's, it's actually the main part of this talk. Two introductions to dependent types. Uh, one for programmers and another one for theoreticians. Like, uh, and in this first introduction to dependent types, I will use the most classical examples. Nothing interesting, but something which is uh, which give us very clear understanding on what is dependent type. Uh, so I'll start with vectors. 
And I will use Idris for examples in this section because Idris is a language which was created with dependent types from scratch. And uh, Idris gives us the most easiest way to use dependent types. It's much easier than other languages uh, supporting dependent types. Like this is a type for a vector. And vector can be specified by a number of elements. That's the first argument here, natural number. And then type of elements. And as a result, you can get the type for vectors. Uh, and this works. Like in this example, you can see we have a vector of three elements. And we have exactly three elements in this particular vector. And if you have less than three, uh, yeah. And so this is basic, the most basic definition here. Like uh, dependent means type depends on a value. That's it. So that, that's enough for programmers. You don't need anything else. So if you have less than three elements, like here you have two, then you can get a type error. And type error, if you look here at this part of this uh, long message, so this is the essence of this type error. And it says like zero is not one. And in this language, it's a type error because these values, zero and one, they are part of the type. So that's why it's, uh, it's a type mismatch. Well, so this is a message from the compiler. It is able to check that uh, there are not enough elements in this, uh, in this particular vector here. All right, so this is dependent typing. We have values in the type signatures, and that's why we can check that here. Uh, and this allows us to write many functions which are bulletproofed thanks to type system. Like if you want to implement function cons for adding element to a vector, you can check uh, you can control all types here. Like if you have vector of n elements, you can get a vector of n plus 1 elements. So it is checked. It's impossible to get the same amount of elements, for example, as a result. So if you have a head function, you want to get first element, you know that it is impossible to get first element of the empty vector. And you can see it right here. Well, it's impossible because you, you cannot construct, uh, you cannot use, uh, apply head to the zero sized vector because it's ruled out with the type. If you use joining two vectors or concatenating vectors, well, it's, it's also controlled the in, in typed. Like if you have n elements and you have m elements and then you join them and you get n plus m elements. So everything here is controlled. And there are even more interesting examples here if you want to uh, do com com component-wise addition of vectors and you have to take two vectors of equal sizes, like here, vector of n elements, vector of n elements, and then you do com component-wise addition. And everything is controlled. And one very useful feature for such languages is that you can implement only two cases here, like if both of them are empty and if both of them have first element. And if you program in Haskell, for example, you have to say, what if first, first vector is empty and another one is not empty? But it's impossible here because you have clearly stated in types that they are of the same size. So it's impossible for one to be empty and for another to be not empty. So you have to define only these lines and that's it. So this is uh, things that you have uh, with, the, with the help of type system. Uh, this is declaration in Idris, exactly. So you have, uh, as usually with lists, for example, you have nil, vector of zero elements, and you have cons, where you add one element to it. So this is definition. It's like generalized abstract, uh, algebraic data types in Haskell. But in Idris, it's just, it looks just in, in, this, in the same way here. Uh, uh, this is another example. Also very classical example for dependent types, this finite set. So you can have a set with one element, you can have a set with two elements, and so on and so forth. So just finite set. And this is a type which is not possible in almost any other programming languages without dependent typing support. 
just cannot have this type which contains particular number of elements. Um, and this is an example how we can use it in Idris. Uh, like this is uh, element of this uh, finite set of three elements and then you just uh, add this FS constructor and build a new value. So just all of them, they are checked. And if there is a problem, well, you just cannot construct such value. Again, thanks to uh, type mismatching. Again, about numbers. So SK, like SS is usual way for constructing natural numbers, like next to K. Uh, so you can, you can see this type mismatch. And if we use vectors, if we use a finite set, the, then you can use index uh, operation. You can implement index operation like, uh, like here. Uh, so you have index, which is a, an element of finite set. You have vector, which is exactly an element. And this is the safest way to do uh, indexation for vectors. It's just impossible to use this function incorrectly. It's impossible to get out of bounds exception. Because you, you, just, you just cannot construct program where you have index out of bounds error. Of course, you have n elements in the set of indices. You have n elements in the vector. So just impossible to do something wrong. And again, very simple definition. You don't have to control anything. You don't have to control things at runtime because everything is checked uh, thanks to the uh, uh, compiler and this type system. So technically, if we look at this uh, function more closely, we could see that there are several implicit arguments. So in fact, we have uh, the first implicit argument. We have a type of element. We have another argument, this natural number, and then these two values, they are used in explicit arguments. So you don't have to define them, but they are there. So this is something underneath this function. So it's, it's uh, a little bit more difficult than we have to write uh, in the program. And this is another function which like ma makes uh, it possible to use this function. If you have some integer numbers, usually, like you ask your user and he wants to get uh, first element, then you have to transform somehow this number one to element of finite set. And then there is a function, and it will be checked that if it is possible to do this conversion, then you will get just element, or you can get nothing. So again, there is no way to make a mistake at runtime. It is just impossible. This possibility was ruled out by the uh, dependent types. Uh, another example, which is uh, much more brain consuming usually, is very simple task of reading a vector. The problem is that when you read the vector from user, you don't know the size in advance. And it can be anything. So uh, if you try to write function like this one, then you will have a problem. Because in dependent types, this basically means that this function should work for any length. But it's not any. It's just one particular length which will be known at runtime. So you don't know it uh, at compile time. So in fact, instead of defining something like that, there is a special data type, which is like for programmers, they say, well, there is a data type which is uh, created spe specifically with uh, this usage in mind. Like it is called dependent pair. And it's like, let's look here. It's a value and then something which depends on this value. So this is a uh, real definition. And then there is a sy syntax. Uh, sugar as usual in programming languages and you can uh, write it like this in idris so it's a dependent pair of a len so you may read it like there will be some natural number for length uh, <coughs> such that you will have a vector of len elements so this is what they do in dependent type so like there will be some value at runtime and then you can write program using this value. It will be just some variable. And you will get the particular value 
when you run this program and then you will get the result from the user. Like if you're interested, this is an implementation of this function. It's quite uh, uh, simple recursive function for reading elements and there are no uh, by the way, look here. Th there is no actual value here because it will be uh, uh, inferred by the type checker, so you don't have to count elements actually because everything will be inferred. So uh, somehow you just add a new element wi which you read from the user. So that's it. Uh, this is very classical example and um, very simple example. Of course, you well basic task you can get your vector from user, then you can process it somehow. Uh, there can be a little bit more sophisticated examples. For example, this uh, verified sort. So what does it mean to sort vector? Well, you, you are given with a vector, and then you return another vector, which is at first sorted, and then the second time it uh, has the same elements as the original one. This is very far uh, specification for sorting function. And to write the simplest implementation of this function, you will need about 100 lines of code. And it will be like, it's not something uh, very good sort. It will be, well, insert sort, like, or a bubble sort, nothing more sophisticated, like 100 of li lines of code to provide this function. It will be totally verified. It will be absolutely correct if you will manage to write it. Yeah? But, if y but it's, it's difficult. Well, 100 lines of code is not that simple for bubble sort. Uh, this is another example from another programming language. The same example of the sorting function. And it's, uh, it looks a little bit different, but it's also another language with uh, dependent types. And it's like more mathematical here. Like for all uh, lists of integer numbers, there exist, we can say it like this here, there exist L prime list of integer numbers, uh, which is equivalent to L prime, uh, to L, and is sorted. Again, the same idea. So full specification. In Quark, to get this right, you will need like 300 lines of code. Again, bubble sort. No quick sort, never. It will be almost impossible. So this is uh, what can be done with dependent types, simple examples. And you can see these examples like everywhere. Like in every tutorial on dependent type, all of them talking about vectors, finite set, about sorting function. So very interesting programmers always do things like that, I know. Uh, all right, so that was first introduction. Second introduction is for theoreticians. I like this introduction more. Like in every my talk here in FBI, I am uh, showing you uh, formulas from the type theory because that's the thing which I know much better than programming. So that's why I'm talking about that. Uh, and also ha I have my slides ready for that, so it's easier to come up with it. Uh, so, uh, but uh, this is actually the reason why I like dependent types. Because this is something which goes not from what programmers need, but something which uh, what goes from nature from the uh, ideas of this world. Uh, you may uh, often come up with this picture, uh, Hank Barendrecht's Lambda Cube, which is one of the most uh, clever things which comes like recently discovered in this world. And this, type syst uh, this, this cube dis describes type systems which we have in uh, our programming languages. For example, uh, current Haskell is somewhere here. And by the way, Scala is also somewhere here. So this is our current industrial, like industrial uh, programming languages. And Idris, for example, is here. 
And Haskell is also is trying to move along this line from this uh, corner of this lambda cube to this one. So this is some theory which supports dependent types. And we want our, pr or maybe we don't want our languages to be there, because uh, there are a lot of things which are enabled by moving to this direction. So we can get vectors. What? Sorry? Question? Uh, so uh, what does it mean? So every point here in this cube is some theory. And technically, we can build programming language. Like when I'm uh, talking to my students about um, type theory, I usually start with in, in this corner, which is so-called simply type lambda calculus. And you can build programming language for simply type lambda calculus like in an hour without any uh, addition, any previous knowledge. And of course, it's much more difficult to get to this corner, and you need like a lot of time to build uh, something for that. But it is, it is all doable. So what is the theory here? So everything, these are just different examples of theory. Some of them are useless. Some of them are more useful. So theory is just the way how you build your terms, like uh, your programs, how you evaluate them, like 2 plus 3 equals to 5 if it's a part of a definition of programming language. Then there is a type system. And of course, we are not talking about languages without type system here. I hope there is no JavaScript specialist here in this room. So we have type system always. We have type checking for that. We have type inference. We have all this stuff in our languages. And then there is also so-called meta theory, uh, many theorems which describe this theory. Like, th there is no such uh, theorem, this theory and uh, programming language which based on this type system is good, or theory that it is bad. But there are other properties. Like, in some theories, every program uh, eventually comes to an end. So there are no loops, infinite loops. It's just one of the properties. Like in some languages, for example, in simply type lambda calculus, it is impossible to write program which is uh, not finishing at some point. And then theoreticians, they do a lot of things here. So what we're interested by, by the way, it's introduction, again, introduction to dependent types. We are interested in how we can get to them using this approach of uh, type theories. Well, there is very well known Curry, Howard, and then there are a lot of uh, bunch of other names that you can add to this uh, name of the correspondence, which is a uh, very simple thing. And uh, in just several minutes, I will uh, build your uh, knowledge about that if you never heard about it. If it's possible, I don't know if it's possible to never heard about Curry, Howard correspondence. So it uh, comes from logic, mathematical logic, to programming. So you can see here, this will be logic part of this correspondence. This will be uh, programming part of this correspondence. So in logic, we start with propositions. Propositions like Minsk is the capital of Belarus. So this is a proposition, uh, which is, by the way, true proposition. Uh, and of course, we have in, in programming part of this table, we have some types. And we are talking about inhabitants. Inhabitants means that are there any elements of this type or not? So sometimes we have elements, sometimes we don't have elements. All right, if we go further with this table, it turns out that true value corresponds to the type which is inhabited. Like almost every useful type is inhabited. And there is one special example. Usually, it is a convenient example uh, to have this file, uh, this type. We usually say unit, unit type. It's unit type with this value. So it's, it's a value. It's the name of the type. There is only one value. So you don't have to distinguish the name of the type and the, the term of that type. And then if you look at next line, false corresponds to the type without any terms. We call it bottom bottom type, no terms. It's the same as false. And then proof in the left part corresponds to the term. Why? 
because if you have a term of some type, it means that the type is inhabited, and it means that you have a true proposition. So that's uh, the basic part of the correspondence, which is not actually uh, very useful, because well, you can you can write the table like this one, just with some bullshit, and there will be no sense. But it turns out that there is some sense because logical operations are very well suited for programming, as uh, we'll see shortly. For example, if you look at conjunction, usual logical conjunction, and it means two components, it's almost the same as Cartesian product in programming. And as a programmer, as we usually say, not Cartesian product, but we say record or struct or sometimes class. So anyway, when you combine several values into one value, it's Cartesian product. And in logic, with conjunction, you can do many things. For example, you can uh, get A and B and prove that A and B is uh, holds. Like, if you have proofs for this component, proof for this component, then you can prove that this also holds. This is a part of proof theory, just part of mathematical logic, and this is a uh, uh, rule, logical rules. So if you prove A, you prove B, then you can prove A and B. And at the same time here, it's usual uh, thing for combining pairs, for building pairs. So you just say, I have first component of this record, I have second component of this record, and then I can combine them and get a pair. So an element of Cartesian product. And if you can prove or combine pair, you can also decompose them. As usually, like in, in logic, you, if you have proof for conjunction, then you can prove both components. And then here in programming, you can use pro uh, projectors. They call it like pi, pi 1 to get first element, pi 2 to get second element. So you can combine pair, and you, you can decompose pair to get elements. And this corresponds to each other. Conjunction there, Cartesian product there, and it's almost the same thing. All right, and then uh, you can continue with many other logical operations. Uh, I will not spend too much time here in this part. For example, uh, disjunction, and it's almost the same thing. You can use disjoint unions here, like, like either type, left A or right B, for example. It's the same thing, it's just like disjunction. And then, as I'm not talking about logical part here, because there are some difficult uh, constructions and I'm not going to discuss them now, but uh, if you know this part, and of course functional programmers use, use these constructions all the time, you can get that it's, it's very close. And then we have functions, of course, and we have uh, the way to construct functions here, and I'm using uh, traditional lambda calculus notation for describing functions. And one of my favorite parts, uh, this logical law is called uh, modus ponens, and you use, the, you use it to prove theorems. Like if uh, something holds, and then you have this fact that from A, A implies B, then you can prove B. And it turns out that this is the same as simple function call here, something that we are doing all the time in programming. You have some arguments, you have function from arguments to results, and you can apply this function to these arguments and get a result. So mod exponents in logic is the same thing as calling function. Like if you call function once in your life, then you just prove something in logic. So that's what we can see from this picture. Uh, oh, it's not picture, of course, but for some of them, it is like picture. So then we can define negation, and we can define a lot of things. And we also, in logical part, we have such thing as a predicate. 
If you learned discrete math course on your first year at the university, then you definitely have had predicates there, you had uh, for all quanta quantification, you have existential quantification, so you had all this stuff. And now, why I like dependent types? Because dependent types, they are just what corresponded to all this stuff. So we can have dependent type, type which depends on the value, and it's the same thing as predicate here. And we also have dependent type function, which is the same as for all quantification, because you return some value depending on the value, and you should return something from every, every value, every x of x uh, here. And then this existential thing is actually dependent pair. And when you are reading a vector, you have some len and vector of this particular length. You are actually building this existential thing. So this is dependent pair is the same thing as there exists some x such that p of x. So it's a logical concept which can be used in programming. So have you ever thought about that? Like if you're reading some array or list from the user, like from terminal, you're actually constructing uh, existential quantification. But well, technically you were doing exactly this thing. So uh, the main principle of this stuff is like proof corresponds to term. So this is carry Howard correspondence in essence, its essence. And then there are many programming languages which uh, implement all this stuff. And some of them allow you to write proofs. Some of them allow you to write terms. And if you write terms, we call you a programmer. If you write proofs, we call you a logician. But basically, you're doing the same thing. It's just about syntax, which syntax you use. Like if you are a Coq programmer, then you're usually writing proofs. If you are Idris programmer, then you usually write terms. But you are doing the same thing. And interesting question is, uh, where is Haskell here? Can we write proofs in Haskell? Can we, well, we of course write terms in Haskell. So all right. Uh, these were two introductions. And now, uh, this is the last section of this talk. I'm uh, going to an end. So this is what I wanted to see for many years. Like, are there interesting industrial uses, usages for dependent types? All right. I like example for vectors and finite sets. Uh, I like many other classical examples about verified sorts and stuff like that. So what about something interesting? Are they doing something interesting in industry with dependent types? Uh, so that's why I was uh, very excited when I first come, come up to Idris. So we just decided, well, I have to teach Idris. It's so great language, practical dependent typing. You can do a lot of very interesting things there. All right, I, I made a course on Idris and I tried to find something interesting. Maybe they have verified data structures like uh, uh, red, black trees verified by the type system in Idris. Maybe some container library. Well, not really. Their container library is almost the same as in Haskell. Nothing special, like the same lists, the same uh, uh, trees, same sets, nothing interesting. So uh, what about other practical libraries? Like I want to do network networking using some dependent type library. No way. Uh, I wanted to do some parsing. Like, well, syn syntax analysis, very interesting task. You can verify a lot of things there any interesting like well it's just just the same parsec library if you know it so nothing interesting it just well it's an address they use uh 
wrong number of colons and that's it so it's just almost the same thing as uh, as in haskell though no dependent types there of course there is very interesting project of implementing idris in idris they call it bloodman so it's a project how to implement compiler in a language with dependent types like for three years they are doing this thing it's not ready yet it is almost ready it is very practical task to implement idris of course like we are doing it all the time in industry but uh, well some problems there is another huge community of coke programmers like 100 of coke programmers all over the world they are doing a lot of very interesting stuff like if you read their papers like they are doing c compiler very good uh, they are doing operating systems like they're doing digital hardware design tools. They're doing blockchain systems. They're verifying distributed systems. Can you imagine 100 of developers doing all this stuff? Like this verified distributed system, it sounds great. Like very big project, distributed systems, verification, and like five person implementing all this stuff. They have. And all of them, they are PhD students, actually. Like, they're doing that for three years, and then they are just go away. Well, because they're, they're not paid for programming in Quark. Well, it's better in blockchain. Like, there are 10 people's, people in this world who are doing blockchain in Quark. They're very successful. They have their salary. I know them. They're very good people. But it's not like very industrial thing, actually. And it takes a lot of time. Like, like in, in this last project, they have serialization library, completely verified in Coq. Serialization, like, well, JSON is too difficult for them. They are doing simpler formats for verification, because otherwise, it's, well, it could take ages for uh, completing that. All right, so uh, not very industrial. And uh, it's close. Maybe it will be there like in 10 years, maybe in 100 years, I don't know. But uh, well, right now they're quite far, actually. OK. Uh, in Haskell, there is a lot of, there are many talks about dependent types. We can fake them, so we can write. Haskell does not support dependent types right now, but we can fake them. There is a library singletons, and it's, it's, it's uh, very sophisticated, but technically it's very simple. So if you want to do dependent typing, you're just using types, and in every type, you use one element. What is singleton? Basically, singleton is a single element set. That's it. There is nothing more clever, clever here. So just one type and one runtime value for it. And you can do anything with uh, runtime values, and that means that you do something with types. So that's that's basic idea. Uh, it's very interesting task to formalize dependent typing. There are several papers on that. Very interesting papers. Well, still not industry. It is very interesting to implement dependent types because Haskell will be simpler once uh, they implement dependent types. Some of, the, some of uh, Haskell internals will become much simpler than they are now. And it will be easier to use Haskell than wh when they, they will be ready. Uh, we have many examples how to use dependent types. Like I've read uh, several the C's papers on dependent types. All of them have this example of vectors, and they're not coming far from it. Uh, and recently, like this August, there was a conference, uh, international conference on functional programming. And there was a paper there which is called Dependently Typed Haskell in Industry. So imagine how excited I was. I said, well, I should read this paper. And uh, it doesn't. Just, there's no. There's no sense just read papers. So I have to talk about this paper somewhere. So I said to the organizers, "Okay, I will give you a talk on dependent types because there is 
very good paper about uh, experience report how they use Haskell and in uh, Haskell with dependent types in industry, and they are very nice guys. Galois, uh, I was giving a talk there in Portland. Their headquarters is in Portland, Oregon. They're very nice guys, but they're doing very interesting stuff about cryptography. They're doing uh, this. Uh, processing or verifying low-level imperative programs. Programs. So what they do, they, they, they take some such languages as Julia, for example, very ooh, quite low-level uh, uh, imperative programming from our point of view, and they transform uh, the programs in this language into some intermediate representation and then verify this uh, representation and then move these uh, then transform these programs to hardware for example and they do some other stuff with that so they uh, these programs implement some cryptographic algorithms so uh, but you see that it's not very practical they're not building websites for example so they're just verifying something extremely sophisticated. And there is one very good quotation I found in that paper. Like, well, we have discovered that it can be done. It means we can use dependent types for something good. And they also say that uh, value uh, is very high but the cost is also very high. And they uh, give several things why it is difficult to use all that stuff. And this is basically a conclusion of my talk uh, because uh, it's uh, their conclusion for Haskell, but in fact this is conclusion for dependent types in general. For example, they say that the biggest problem is training. They say, just, just write, write in this paper, it is difficult to find experienced Haskell programmers. Oh, really? And they, you know, they work very closely with academia. Like, all of the offers, they are PhDs. And they say, well, it's difficult, of course, uh, to, to, to get people be able to program in this style. And they say, well, there is a problem with tool support. Well, of course. Like, in Haskell, there is a problem um, uh, Haskell tools don't support this uh, special way of development programs with dependent types, which we have in Idris. Like in Idris, you can generate many parts of your program automatically from the types. It's impossible to do in Haskell. But unfortunately, in Haskell, we have a very good profiler, and we don't have profiler in Idris, in Coq, in Agda, in uh, other languages. So it's also a problem. So we have something good here, something good there, but it looks like impossible to get good things like profiling and interactive editing for one language. All right. Then there are also type system limitations in current Haskell. Well, because it's, uh, uh, it's not full-blown dependent types right now. And technically or theoretically, there always will be some limitations. Like there will be some programs which are good programs, but which are impossible to be implemented with any type system. And then they say that, well, it's difficult to do proofs. And if they are able to write proofs, now the, the most interesting part, if they are able to prove something, then the code executable will be extremely slow. And they say, well, we have completely verified and proved parts of our program which is very slow. And we have absolutely unverified parts of our code, which is fast. And we do manual inspection. If it's the same thing, and we use testing to make sure that our verified implementation works in the same way as our unverified implementation. Because, well, you can prove things about uh, list, but you cannot prove them about hash tables. But, well, in order to get some uh, speed, you need to use uh, hash tables instead of lists. Otherwise, it's just uh, useless. So, well, there is a problem. And then there is a problem that you have some, these, uh, some parts of your program are typed, and then you just 
get to parsing JSON files, which is untyped. And then you can use such types as any, like do you know this type, any, which means just whatever. I don't know, well any. And everything works with just any. It was supposed to be a number and it's not a number. Well, that, that's how it works. So my point here is that uh, it is a very nice thing, but we don't have good examples and we don't know how to use it practically. And that's very unfortunate things. And I hope that in some near future we'll see more about that because it's a nice thing. And I'd like to see all this stuff in practical everyday programming. But well, unfortunately, not now. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.